Hello. So, my assessment task for the film festival is the Wolf Motor Function Test, developed by Stephen Wolf and colleagues in 2001. So, the theory behind the Wolf Motor Function Test comes from constraint-induced movement therapy, which is based on neuroplasticity and cortical reorganisation. This means that when there is brain damage resulting from a stroke, a hemiparesis or traumatic brain injury, that a part of the brain is damaged affecting the homunculus, which controls what parts of the brain control our motor movements. And when this damage occurs, there's an attempt by the brain to rewire its circuitry so that the affected limb may compensate for the non-affected and that this part of the brain does not need to be used as it normally would. This is called learned non-use, and the theory behind it comes from a series of experiments done on animals where they found that monkeys' brains no longer receive sensory input from the affected upper extremity, and behaviourally this manifested as a complete disregard for the differentiated limb, or learned non-use, and this is what constraint-induced movement therapy tries to work against. Through intensive motor training and behavioural techniques, we want to retrain our patients, because it's similar for people, to regain use of their affected limb through deliberate use and of daily activities throughout interventions. And that's where my assessment comes in. So the Wolf Motor Function Test is designed to assess upper extremity following a stroke or traumatic brain injury. It was comprised of 21 items initially, changed to 17, 15 of which are timed functional items, testing motor ability, and two of which are strength-based items. The Wolf Motor Function Test has a combination of gross hand movements and more fine motor movements to test a whole range of motor skills in the affected limb of the client. Um, its progression from smaller items requiring a uh, smaller number of joints and fewer movements from simple shoulder abduction to more complex movements, uh, shoulder flexion and extension, uh, wrist supination, pronation, grip strength and pinch grip. Wolf motor function test can be used to assess the effects of constraint induced movement therapy but also can be used to assess the effects of uh, functional electrical stimulation, robotic therapy or bilateral arm training and uh, it comprises a, a range of, uh, of different tasks varying in motor complexity of the affected limb primarily and uh, it's a very good guide for where patients are in their treatment. So the properties of the test, uh, the properties of the test are the patient and the therapist are present for it and it runs for approximately 30 minutes. The equipment provided as you can see is listed there and I've brought along some props here. This would be a box that would be used for the patient to abduct their shoulder to and uh, there would be more fine movements as well such as picking up cards like this off the table, um, lifting a pencil off the table which I will also show you and folding a towel. There's also a JMR dynamometer used for grip strength. So this is what the 17 items of the test look like. As I mentioned, it begins from quite simple, simple shoulder abduction onto the table and onto the box that I showed you to more complex things using weights, uh, to shoulder extension and flexion, pulling weights, to cupping and drinking from a can, to just shoulder flexion and extension, to more uh, fine motor movements, lifting a pencil, picking up a paper clip, but what is important to notice is what we focus on during this examination. And these are the things that we focus on. We're looking for the degree to which the head and trunk are maintained in normal alignment for shoulder extension, abduction, uh, flexion, wrist pronation and supination, all of the tasks that we're assessing. We want to look at the degree to which our clients, for instance, the can drinking, which I will show you, uh, to the degree to which they don't use the full extent of their affected arm, they will compensate with the head and the trunk. And this is... Oh, and this is what we want to assess for because this is what constraint induced movement therapy is trying to work against. And we also want to see the degree to which the affected, uh, the non-affected arm part of me is used to compensate for the affected limb. And this is what we want to work against. So typical instructions of the client might look something like this. So for Harold Johnson, which was my test client, I would say pick up the basket with your left hand, given that he had a left hemiparesis, and place the basket on the rolling table. The far edge of the basket should not go past the edge of the bedside table. Try not to move your feet doing this task and do it as quickly as you can. We say that because the, the, the test records two different kinds of data. One is the functional assessment scale, which is a six point Likert scale, testing patients' motor ability, the quality of their motor ability, which I will show you a bit more in just a moment. And we also assess performance time scoring, which is the amount of time patients take to complete each task. 
Participants have a maximum of 120 seconds for each task to complete, and if they cannot complete it in this time, then we move on to the next task. If they make mistakes during the procedure, we have to give them the maximum time score. Uh, and so we get two different kinds of data. So this is the functional assessment scale, what it looks like. Uh, obviously, you've got zero at the top here of being does not use the uh, involved arm at all, and five being the arm completely participates. Now we expect from my client, Mr. Johnson, that he would range somewhere between three to four here, being that the movement is relatively normal, but it's slower and it lacks precision. Again, this kind of ordinal data is really useful to help uh, occupational therapists understand where clients are at in terms of their motor function immediately following a stroke, and that's why it's evidence-based for acute and subacute stroke settings. So the advantages to the test is that it has high test retest reliability, as Davis found, which is that at multiple times the test will yield similar results. Uh, there's also a high inter-rater reliability, which means examiners tend to agree on the properties of the test and get similar results, as several different studies have demonstrated with a strong 95% confidence rating. And there's also inter-rater reliability, which means that uh, um, uh, among the test uh, there within examiners, there's a good mixture of um, of, of data uh, that, that they agree upon and internal consistency which means that the test is a good indicator of what it says it is and each of the functional items has a good outcome for motor ability and also has physical and qualitative measures of performance in time and functional ability scales and it focuses on the affected limb and hemiparesis which is key part of constraint induced movement therapy and uh, it's why it's such a valid test and it continues to be used. It's also quite cheap and easy to manage and, and run. So the minimal clinically significant difference, Lang and colleagues found that for the dominant hand, a minimal change of 19 seconds for the time score was a minimal clinically significant difference. But other studies have said different. The uh, minimal detectable change for the Wolf motor function was 0.7 seconds for Fritz and colleagues with a 95% confidence interval. And also the minimal detectable change was 0.37 seconds for Duff and colleagues each task, which amounted to a, a total change of 20 points on the functional assessment scale out of 75. The limitations of the test is that some items have been validated as useful predictors for upper limb function and others have not. Uh, a study by George and colleagues found that the testable items that uh, involved fine motor movements, including lifting the can, lifting the pencil, <coughs> turning the key in the lock and folding the towel, had the biggest uh, had the strongest correlation values for improved motor performance over time, as we can see here with the second range of p-values there. <coughs> Furthermore, there was a proportion of non-responders in the study, and this was a group of people that did not respond to constraint-induced movement therapy, and it's been suggested for these individuals that compensatory strategies, mobility aids and assistive devices is better uh, because a certain proportion of individuals don't show improvement with the Wolf motor function test, but this is not a majority. Uh, Morris also found that nine items uh, of, of, the, of the individual 17 didn't have adequate inter-rater reliability for functional ability, but the ones that produced the best scores were those that were testing fine motor function, which would be picking up the pencil and paper clip and, and those sorts of things. It's also quite reliant on the precision of stopwatch timing, but some other studies have, have managed to get around this too by uh, having mm -hmm. electronic filming. So our example client is Mr. Johnson, who has had a right hemispheric stroke, causing left hemiparesis, so he would be an ideal candidate to do the Wolf motor function test, um, given that he has reduced sensation or weakness in his upper limb. So we would assess that he would achieve, I'm sorry that the, the that this didn't photocopy very well, but uh, we assess that he would achieve a total functional assessment ability score of 51, given that most of the time he would get a 3 or a 4 on a lot of these simple motor tasks, which if we go back, we know has, uh, we, we know means um, that the, the motor function is relatively normal, but there is a degree of, of compensation used. So the last thing I wanted to show was a simple demonstration of one of the tasks, which is a lifting can, and this is one that requires compensation. Now the key thing to watch here is the degree to which the head and trunk are moved when the client moves, and there's not a full reach of extension 
there uh, with the elbow and he has to compensate with the trunk. This is exactly the type of thing we're looking for and trying to prevent. Thank you very much for listening.